So on this early summer eve, I'd like to share one of my favorite stories, one of the legends from King Arthur. And if you've been with me before, I think about a year and a half, I might have shared it. And if this is a familiar uh, legend, then I'd like to invite you as you're listening to sense what characters you identify with, okay? So in this story, King Arthur is out wandering and, you know, doing his hunting and going through the, the deep forest and he encounters an enemy. He encounters a shadow knight who has great powers and he um, casts a spill over King Arthur that renders him terrified and powerless. And he basically says, I'll give you your life and your freedom if you can return in seven days with the answer to a question. And the question is, what is it that all women most desire? That's the question, okay? So you can start thinking about that if you haven't heard the answer already. So he agreed and he went around asking anyone he encountered. He asked the girl herding geese and the alewife. He asked great ladies. And, you know, they said different things, but none of, none of their responses really rang true. So he, uh, the final morning, he was very heavy hearted because he realized that he would have to submit and die. He didn't know the answer. So uh, I'm going to read you one of my favorite versions of it. I'll read you the rest of the story. It says, it was, uh, he rode again into the woods and through the forest and on this ride this time going back to meet the the shadow knight he ran into a hideously ugly woman uh, it's, it's one that was it says was ugliness was so great that the original texts go on for many a verse describing it <laughs> I, I won't <laughs> so she stopped him and said she had the right answer and could save his life if he agreed to her terms and he asked her what they were and she said this my name is Dame Ragnell, and I want to marry one of your knights, Sir Gawain. Well, Arthur's heart dropped because he realized he couldn't just commit Sir Gawain to, to marrying what he considered to be this ugly old hag. And, and he said, I'll have to ask, you know, I can't just say so. But he went back to the court and immediately Sir Gawain said, of course I will. I'd do anything to be of help. So he said, even if she was a devil. So Arthur returns to where Dame Ragnell is waiting and tells her that Gawain has agreed to marry her and uh, she gave him the answer, okay? She gave him the answer. And on the appointed day, so Arthur goes back to meet the Shadow Knight and has a little fun with him, tells him all the wrong answers first, but then finally goes, wait, I have one more answer. And. Uh, he, he gives that answer and, and the Shadow Knight roars with frustration because he's right and he has to keep his word and Arthur's won his freedom. And how many of you know the answer? Do some of you remember? Some of you, a few of you, yeah. So the answer to the, to the riddle was sovereignty. That beyond all things a woman desire sovereignty. So you can think about that a bit. And so Arthur had to keep his promise. So Sir Gawain and he and some of the knights rode out to the woods to find Ragnell and bring her to court. But upon sight some of the knights were sickened and some even insulting. But Sir Gawain looked steadily at the lady. Something in her pathetic pride and the way she lifted her hideous head caused him to think of a deer with the hounds after it. Something in the depth of her bleared gaze reached him like a cry for help. And he reprimanded the other knights. Right there before her, he asked her for her hand in marriage, and she offered him a way out, but he was steadfast. And she accepted, saying, you shall not regret this wedding. So they married in the chapel, and all came forward to offer words of congratulations, but they could barely speak as they were so horrified by Sir Gawain's fate. Uh, the ladies came up and touched her fingertips as briefly as might be but couldn't bear to look at her in the eye and kiss her cheeks. And only Cabal the dog came and licked her hand with a warm wet tongue and looked up into her face with amber eyes that took no account of her hideous aspect. 
for the eyes of a hound see differently than the eyes of man. At last it was over and the couple led to, was led to their chamber. There Gawain sat in a deeply cushioned chair, gazed at the fire, reluctant to glance in the direction of his bride until she said softly, Gawain, my lord and love, have you no word for me? Can you not even bear to look my way? Gawain forced himself to turn his head and he looked and then sprang up in amazement for there between the candle scones were the most beautiful woman he ever had seen. He stared, speechless in wonder, and finally finding his tongue, asked her how this could be. And she said, I've been under an enchantment. And because you've taken me for your wife, it's partly lifted, but only half. Since for now a hard choice lies before you. And here's the choice. I can be fair by night and foul by day, or foul by night and fair by day. Decide what you want. <laughs> What do you think he chose? <laughs> think about it. So he, he ponders, and he ponders the events that led up to the moment, and then it dawns on him what answer he must give. He say, said, whichever way it is, it is you who must endure the most suffering. And being a woman, I am thinking that you have more wisdom in such things than I. Make the choice yourself, dear love, and whichever way you choose, I shall be content. She cried out in joy, My Lord, you are as wise as you are noble and true, for you have given me what every woman genuinely desires, the answer to the riddle, sovereignty over herself. You've broken the spell completely, and I'm free of it to be my true self by night and day. This is the final bit. For seven years, Gawain and Ragnell knew a great happiness together, and during all that time, Gawain was a gentler and kinder and more steadfast man than ever he had been before. But after seven years, she left. No one knows where she went, and something of Gawain went with her. Okay, so that's the legend, that's the myth. And then the inquiry really is, well, what is sovereignty? What is spiritual sovereignty? Okay, so we know so spiritual sovereignty is not seeking of external power, right? It's, uh, even though it's fully empowering, it's not power over. So spiritual sovereignty, uh, my understanding, is that it's freedom from any limiting sense of who we are any identification with a small or narrow sense of self. So there's a freedom from with sovereignty. We are free from some limiting story of who we are. But there's also a freedom too. We are freedom, free then to live from our heart, live from our wholeness, live from our creativity, live from our love. So free from a limiting story or identification and free to live from our Buddha nature. That's spiritual sovereignty. So one of the ways I, I like listening to it is with Joseph Campbell is he says that the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. Really being who you are, like inhabiting the fullness of who you are. So then the inquiry is, well, what makes it possible? What makes it possible to really awaken past those stories? And the way that I think is really helpful to understand it is that we have this capacity to see the truth. And, and sometimes it's been described as soul recognition, that we can see through the trance, through the conditioning, through the ego covering, not make any of that wrong, but we can see through, we can see who's there. And of course that means seeing who's here, that we can see past the trance and, and recognize our own soul. And by soul you might say, well, what is soul? I think of soul as the way that, that spirit or consciousness expresses uniquely through this particular body-mind. We can see that spirit, that light, in ourselves and others. 
So we'll explore this week and next week uh, this process of recognizing who we really are, recognizing within our own being, recognizing in each other, and living from it. And there are three ways of training that I'd like to emphasize as we explore this soul recognition. And one of them is the training in presence that allows us to see, and these are all universal, see that every one of us is insecure. I mean, every one of us is living in a changing universe that's out of control. Every one of us is mortal. Every one of us will lose what we really, really want to hold on to. We're insecure. So that's the first seeing, that we look at each other and there's that vulnerability that's shared. And that brings up the compassion that allows us to see through the, the conditioning. The second seeing is that we see the goodness. That every one of us has this aliveness and this love and this creativity and this basic goodness. And we see that. And that allows us to see through the trance. And then the third, and I'm, next week is when I'll be uh, emphasizing that, is there is what might be called beingness itself. That just as we, instead of getting fixated on the waves, we can sense the ocean, the pure beingness of who's here, who's really looking out through those eyes, the consciousness itself. Okay, so these are the three trainings that allow us to see past the mask, past our own and each other's. And by the way, you cannot separate that training. You cannot just say, oh, well, I'm just learning to, you know, see my Buddha nature. It's impossible because if you're seeing your own Buddha nature, then you're going to be seeing from a place of wakefulness that absolutely has the lucidity and the tenderness to see who's there in others. And if you begin to see who's there and others, absolutely opens you to yourself. So in a way, we're talking about the bodhisattva uh, path. A bodhisattva is an awakened being who actually has this capacity to remember Buddha nature and to call it out. And you can see a bit of that in Sir Gawain. Uh, you know, I, I love the way it was described in this story that, you know, he sees her a bit and he sees something in that pathet behind that patheticness that's calling for him, calling to him. He sees that, that universal vulnerability. And then, of course, on the wedding night, he gets to see her beauty outer and inner, her glow. And then, in that final fantastic choice he made, he sees that she's got the wisdom, it's in her, that Buddha nature, that consciousness itself. So let's explore first, which is, I think is really valuable. We, these are the three seeing of truth that we'll be going at. We first say, well, what prevents us from seeing that? How can we go around and much of the time, that's not what we're noticing. How can we get fixated on the what's wrong, what's missing in ourselves and each other? Because we do, you know? And in the broadest sense, it helps to understand, and this is the evolutionary perspective too, that we come into existence and there's this vulnerability. And every organism finds a way to have a shell or some skin or some toughness to protect. You know, viruses use camouflage just the way other animals use camouflage. We have to deceive. That's one of our really important strategies to survive. You can see it through nature. So we have these coverings that are actually meant to cover over what we think might not be okay. There's a... You can come up and look at this later if you want. This is a a cartoon and it's called Serial Killer Whale. And it's got this, uh, this whale's being dragged out of his house by the police, he's in handcuffs, <laughs> this huge whale. And you see the neighbors are gossiping and they're saying, 
Yeah, he was quiet, kept to himself, always paid his rent on time. <laughs> anyway, it's real cute. You can... So what happens is very early on, we get that there are forces in this universe that are threatening to us and that in some way we need to cover over and that there's something about us that we need to protect and not show others some vulnerability, maybe some neediness in some way. So we cover over. Now there's a story of a little boy who opens the big old family Bible. He's fascinated, he's looking through the pages, he's turning them, and out of one of the pages falls this dried leaf that had been kind of compressed in the, in the Bible. And he's so excited, he goes, Mama, look what I found. And she says, well, what do you have, dear? And he says, look, look, and it says, with an astonishment, he says, it's Adam's suit. <laughs> So it goes way back in our evolution and in our mythology that we cover over. And, and it, goes to, it goes together that when we start seeing through it, you know, seeing through our covers, we see through others too. You know, Mark Twain says that when I was 14, my father in particular was such a fool. He, it was embarrassing to have him around. I marveled at, at age 21 how in seven years the old fellow had learned so much, you know. <laughs> So, with mindfulness, we become more transparent, okay? The, the covering, when we're mindful, the covering is, does not create as much illusion. When we're not mindful, whatever our defenses are, whatever our way of moving through and protecting, we get identified with it. So our personal story, our narrative, becomes really narrow. Okay? We get identified with our covering, with our ego covering, with that conditioning. And when we become mindful, we start seeing it as conditioning. And that seeing is the beginning of waking up from the trance. It's no longer so much my ego, it's just ego conditioning. And that's a world of difference. And if you can really get the difference between my aversion or my nastiness or my jealousy or whatever it is, my aggression, with, okay, this is the conditioning of aggression. This is how the organism responds when it feels threatened. And it sounds heady, but it's not. It removes that sense of, this is me. Okay, we're not as identified with the mask. So what do we see? And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give the, some of the more common uh, presentations of, of how we go into trance that we can start being mindful of. And as you listen, you might reflect, well, when I'm with another person, how do I go into trance? And by that I mean, how do I just start believing in the mask, seeing my own mask, believing in the other person's mask? What happens so that I stop seeing who's there? Okay, so our main ways of going into trance. One of them is when we're really wanting. And you can sense when you're with somebody what happens when you really want their attention, or you really want their approval, you really want something from them. And you might have in your mind somebody that you're really wanting something from. You want their money, their time, their approval, their attention. Now when we're wanting, and you can sense this for yourself, what is your experience of who you are? Can you sense the tightening, the unpleasantness of, of needing or wanting, the kind of leaning forward? When you're wanting, how much do you see of the other person, who they really are? What's maybe difficult for that person right now, where they're feeling vulnerable? What brings them alive? How much do you see? 
when we want a really clear look at this, we can kind of consider romantic love or infatuation. I think that's the best example. <laughs> when we're in, in fact, the delusion that comes then, how much do we see then? Who are we then? Who's the other then? I think that's when it gets most interesting. There's a saying that when you're in love, it's the most glorious two and a half days of your life. <laughs> <laughs> So this is biochemical cocktail, it's like cocaine, and it definitely has a twist on things. This is uh, Irving Yalom, who wrote the book Love's Executioner. I do not like to work with patients who are in love. Perhaps it's because of envy I too crave enchantment. Perhaps it's because love and psychotherapy are fundamentally incompatible. <laughs> Strong language. The good therapist fights darkness and seeks illumination while romantic love is sustained by mystery and crumbles upon inspection. I hate to be love's executioner. Now just to say, this again is just to distinguish between the kind of infatuated romantic love that he's talking about and a deeper love that's really selfless and open and all pervasive. And then there's many gradations in between. But when we think of it, for any of us that have ever been infatuated, and I won't ask for a hand raise here, <laughs> um, you know what it's like. You look back on it and who was that crazy person anyway, <laughs> you know? It's hard to believe and a little embarrassing because we take it personally. So the wanting mind that tweak, twerks it, twerks it. And then there's aversion. When we are really thick in judgment or hate or anger, who are we then? What's our sense of who we are then? Maybe there's somewhere right now that you're caught in feeling really judgmental towards somebody. It's helpful to bring these things to mind while we're reflecting together. Somewhere where you know you're, you're really stuck in some sort of dislike or judgment. And when you're in that, and these are trances, what's your sense of who you are? And do you like yourself? Are you living from your fullness? We know it's very narrowing, very tight. And what do we see of the other person? We can't see the other person's heart or fears or vulnerability in any way that really has empathy. Why? When we are caught in strong wanting and strong fear, our limbic system is active. It's almost the reptilian and mammalian parts of us are really full throttle ahead. But the parts of our frontal cortex that have to do with empathy and compassion and seeing clearly, not so activated, okay? So this is in a way another description of trance. We're cut off from our wholeness when we're caught in wanting something from somebody, really wanting their attention, when we're caught in fearing. One woman uh, just talked to me recently, her daughter's a senior in high school around here and she's now beginning to get the reality that uh, she's the last of you know, four, that it's the reality of the empty nest. And it's living with a lot of regret because she feels like for the last couple of years she's been very caught in being the critical mom and seeing everything about messy rooms and undone homework and not doing your share and inconsiderate and now downright rude, but it's, it's become the habit of, she, the filter is what's wrong. And she realizes how much her heart got small and she actually lost sight of who her daughter was. She wasn't paying attention to the rest of her daughter. There's something called object fixated awareness where we get really narrow and really fixated and we lose that receptivity to truly take in another. And when we're narrowed, we're not taking in who we are either. Now for this woman, it's not too late. And she, she feels that. 
and I, or she felt that when she was talking to me. But we're not always aware of how much we're carrying judgment towards somebody. We're not always aware of whether we're living in something of, you know, she doesn't really care, she doesn't really listen, or he doesn't hold up his end, or whatever. And then we're also not aware of how much we stereotype, how quickly we put somebody into, cluster them with a group of people that have certain characteristics and we stop seeing who's there. We do it so, with socioeconomic differences and we do it politically and racially, sex orientation, religion. We do it very, very quickly. We do it just with physical appearance. I mean, I remember being in college and I wasn't aware of how much, and you know, I was kind of, you know, hippie, um, you know, appearance and so on. And I wasn't aware at that time of how much I immediately categorized any guy with really short hair. I mean, I, I mean, it's like, it was instant. It was, you know, it was kind of a, it was really a big deal when I think back that I really made all these assumptions based on short hair. And some of them have carried over, so my poor husband is afraid to cut his hair, you know? <laughs> That's not totally true. <laughs> So, and then I left, you know, being in, in college and being a hippie to join an ashram and then I wore this white garb with a turban and went around and then everybody categorized me. You know, we got called towel heads and cone heads and so on. It really, it's very, very intense. It was, it was great learning to be on the other side and wherever I went, I was different. And often that difference meant that I knew people were... Um, making assumptions about my weirdness that were probably partly true, you know, but, <laughs> but they were doing it. So it's a trance. It's a trance when we move through the world and we categorize. One woman described how she did it with, she said, that walking down 7th Avenue in Manhattan for, and realized for the last 15 minutes I have compared every other woman's body size to my own to see who's heavier and who's lighter. Did I say 15 minutes? I meant 15 years. So we have these filters and they're quite painful because they don't, we can't see through the mask, our own or another's. One of the biggest ways that we go into this trance is when we're trying to control another person. In any moment that we're trying to make somebody different, in any moment we're trying to control what they think of us or how they behave, in those moments we don't have the presence to see what's true. In the moments of, in, whether it's really gross manipulation or just subtly presenting ourselves in a certain way to make an impression we don't see. I mean, some of you might remember the story of guys driving down the backwoods of Montana, he sees a sign saying, talking dog for sale. And so he rings the bell and the owner appears and says, the dog's in the backyard. So the guy goes into the backyard and he sees a nice looking lab retriever sitting back there. And he says to the lab, you talk? Yep, the lab replies. <laughs> After the guy recovers from the shock of hearing a dog talk, he says, well, so what's your story? Lab looks up and says, well, I discovered I could talk when I was pretty young. <laughs> I wanted to help the government, so I told the CIA. In no time at all, they had me jetting from country to country, sitting in rooms with spies and world leaders, because no one figured a dog would be eavesdropping. <laughs> I was one of their most valuable spies for eight years running, but the jetting around really tired me out. I knew I wasn't getting any younger, so I decided to settle down. I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security, you know, wandering near suspicious characters, listening in. I uncovered some incredible dealings. I was awarded a batch of medals. Got married, had a mess of puppies. Now I'm just retired. Guy's amazed. Goes back in and asks the owner what he wants for the dog. Ten dollars, says the guy. What? Ten dollars? That dog's amazing. Why are you selling him so cheap? Because he's a liar. He never did any of that shit. <laughs> so 
So again, the common denominator of, and, and the reason we're talking about this is, very natural responses to our world of how our ego is designed to prove ourselves, to get approval, to want things from other people, to get infatuated, to judge. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just that if we're not mindful of that ego activity, we become identified with it. We become the needy one who wants somebody's attention. Or we become the angry one who's kind of nasty. So the, the inquiry is how do we learn in the midst of this natural ego activity not to judge it and then become the judge of the ego because that's just another identity, right? But how do we see through? So I'd like to share um, a story with you that's utterly out of season but is to me a story that taught me a whole lot. And um, I heard it on Christmas Eve when I, I uh, for many years went to church. I grew up Unitarian. This was at a Unitarian church. It was told by a Unitarian minister. So a woman, this, um, she didn't tell the story, but the woman's also in the story as a Unitarian minister, was traveling with her husband and two children on Christmas Day, and they were going on this long, grueling trip, and they stopped at an empty diner, nearly empty diner. And as they're waiting for their meal, her one-year-old begins waving from his high chair and calling, hi there, hi there, to somebody that's sitting on the other end of the restaurant. restaurant. And to his mother's dismay, it turns out to be this wreck of a guy with tattered clothing and dirty clothes. He's unkempt, he's unwashed, he's obviously a homeless drunk. But he's waving back to her boy and calling, hi there, baby boy, hi there, big boy, I see you, buster. So they're getting this thing going, this kid and this guy. And she and her husband exchanged looks. You know, a few other patrons in their restaurant were raising eyebrows, shooting glances at each other. So nobody's amused by what's going on. They ate their meal and the disturbance continued. Now the old guy was shouting across the room, do you know patty cake? Atta boy, look at that, you know peekaboo, and hey look, he knows peekaboo and that kind of thing. So the woman and her husband were cringing with embarrassment. Even their six-year-old says, why is that old guy talking so loud? So she tried turning the one-year-old's chair around, but he screamed and twisted to face his new buddies. That didn't work. And not even wanting to finish their meal, her husband got up to pay the bill and took the older son to the car. The woman lifted her baby in her arms and prayed to herself that she could pass by the old drunk without further commotion and get to the door. Clearly, God had other plans, though, as she writes it. She approached him and her young son reaches out to his new friend with both arms in that kind of child's pick-me-up position signal. And she could see in the man's eyes saying, please, would you let me hold your baby? So there wasn't time for an answer. The boy propelled himself <laughs> into uh, the old man's arms. And for a few long moments, there was a communion, an old man and a, a young boy in a love relationship. She could see the tears beneath the man's lashes as her son laid his head on his shoulder. And he gently rocked and cradled the boy. And then he looked straight into her eyes. You take care of this baby, he said firmly. And when he reluctantly handed the baby back, it was as if he were tearing away his own heart. His final words to her were, God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas gift. So she mumbled something in return and rushed out to the car, her own tears flowing freely, and her only thought was, my God, my God, forgive me. So after um, the minister finished telling the story, uh, there were just no dry eyes in the room. I mean, everybody was with it. Um, and I know for myself, what it set off in me was this kind of reflection of how many moments of my life have I dismissed somebody? You know, just made assumptions and dismissed, like not seeing the humanity. Like her not seeing that this, this being had this, this love and this tenderness in him. 
not seeing his vulnerability. We, we get very two-dimensional. And for me, that it set off a reflection that is an ongoing one. Because, like everybody, it's, I find it's just very easy to get, in, especially when stressed, just see the mask and not really look, not take the time, not look.